Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. This is another ranking video, this time featuring my all-time favorite band. And that would be Dead Can Dance, but you probably already knew it. Obviously from the thumbnail of this video. So Dead Can Dance was established by the Australian singer Lisa Gerrard and the rather cosmopolitan Englishman Brendan Perry who at this point had moved from New Zealand to Melbourne and was part of the local punk scene. The couple quickly moved to London, where they lived under rather difficult circumstances. Here they signed with the label 4AD run by Ivo Watts Russell. The rest is history. Although to say that Dead Can Dance achieved their status as this unique global phenomenon quickly would be entirely wrong, since the band was basically an underground act for the first 12 years of their existence. There is not a single Dead Can Dance album that I dislike, so please keep in mind that even the album lowest on my list is pretty close to my heart. So no need to spank me if I rank one of your favorites really low, because all these albums are my favorites and uh, I return to each one of them. So let's begin. Number 10 is the 1993's Into the Labyrinth. This album appeared after three years of studio hiatus. It is an album that certainly can win you over and captivate you with its excellent recording quality and some really wonderful songwriting. It also marks the beginning of a kind of third chapter in the band's history moving heavily into ethnographic realms. Now, I could be right by saying that this is sonically the best sounding Dead Can Dance album. The mix and the overall atmosphere is flawless. The opener, Yulunga, is a great example of Lisa Gerard's abilities to incorporate her unique vocal style into significantly more exotic music. Although it is important to understand that the music they create here functions much more under the same paradigm as the music of, for example, John Hassel, which he coined as fourth world music. So you can't take these somewhat exotic tracks and pin them on a particular region of music. That can dance are not interested in that. They are always travelers just passing through and touching upon styles without trying to emulate a concrete regional sound. Yolunga is a great example because you can't even say if this is influenced by Middle Eastern, African or South American music. It is little of all of it and little of none of it. Ubiquitous Mr. Lovegraph is an incredible song and a rare moment when Brandon expresses his anger over a failed relationship, wonderfully supported by the idea to have the sound of a whip instead of a snare drum. Well, you have to hear it to understand. But interestingly, it is not the only time Brandon Perry has written about manipulative, possessive women. Just check out the song Medusa on his first solo album. Into the Labyrinth is a wonderful record, no doubt, and it was an album that actually shifted the band out of the underground for good. So it was certainly rather successful and I don't feel like criticizing it. But it is the one that can dance album where I sometimes feel it's maybe a bit long and long-winded. I guess this is another example of the CD album syndrome where with the establishment of CDs suddenly the traditional album length of 40 minutes shifted towards 60 or 70 minutes. So out of the blue suddenly every band had to produce double albums all the time. And looking through the 90s I feel like it shows. And it is not a coincidence that now, after CDs are being phased out, a lot of bands that I come across come back to a length format of 30 minutes now. Number 9. The debut album Dead Can Dance from 1984. Now this is a bit of a very rough diamond, but still with this great sense of yearning for distant shores and distant times. To some extent the musicians here operate under the usual paradigm of a rock band, using instruments like drums and electric bass and electric guitars, something that would completely phase out in the following albums, in favor of classical and more folkloristic instruments. 
The style of the band is still quite undecided at this point, swinging between dark post-punk experiments and melancholic indie rock musings. Today we know that the rather ethereal side had prevailed and defined the band's direction. Nonetheless, there are some fascinating tracks here, beginning with the raw yet dramatic instrumental The Fatal Impact. This album is not just an eccentric example of a band trying things out. It actually contains tracks that would become milestones in their catalogue, particularly The Feverish Frontier and The Passionate Ocean, showcasing Lisa Gerard's unique vocal abilities. Same goes for the almost rock-driven A Passage in Time, sung by Brandon Perry. There are also quirky cul-de-sac compositions like East of Eden or Wild in the Woods, or a track like Threshold, reflecting the, the, the post-punk aesthetic of the early 80s. But interestingly, it is the very last track of this album called Musica Eternal that seems to point towards the future direction. Here, for the first time, we get a hint of what Dead Can Dance will sound like in the following years. Number 8. Garden of the Arcane Delights, also from 1984. This was originally released as an EP, but I'm featuring it here for a particular reason. I will get to that. This record starts with the emphatic opener Carnival of Light, followed by the wonderful In Power We Entrust the Love Advocated, which was originally actually called Panacea, one of the most beautiful Dead Can Dance tracks and a big highlight of their early years, I think. The melancholic and yet mysterious The Arcane is a fascinating deep cut from the Dead Can Dance catalogue and easily overlooked. The almost pastoral Flowers of the Sea is further solidifying Lisa Gerard's image of a musical priestess. So why did I include this EP, despite the fact that uh, it's only around 16 minutes long? Well, it's because this is a reissue by 4AD that came out as a double album, um, featuring the Peel sessions recorded in Studio 4 and 5 of the BBC on the 28th November of 1983 and 13th of June in 1984. So this is a very unique part of Dead Can Dance discography, presenting some tracks that never appeared on an album, particularly the waltz-timed Labor of Love and the adventurous Penumbra with his dark gothic bass line. Overall, the music has a wonderful warm sound and in his final rendition as a double 12 inch, Garden of the Arcane Delights is a wonderful snapshot of the band in their early stage. Number 7. Spirit Chaser from 1996. Spirit Chaser marked the last Dead Can Dance album for many years. It was an album entirely with a focus on Middle Eastern and African music, but also incorporating elements from South America, but again, as you would expect from Dead Can Dance, in a rather ciphered way. The music appears much more cohesive than the previous album Into the Labyrinth, although I'm pretty sure that Into the Labyrinth sold better. Spirit Chaser is a very atmospheric and very spiritual album. If Within the Realm of a Dying Sun would be the perfect winter album, then this is an album for the summer. This record takes you on a journey to the equator. All you need is to close your eyes and you will be transported in a world of mangroves and low-hanging palm trees. It is a world of tribalism and rituals, but also a powerful cry of indignation and insurrection. Also, this is a somewhat unique moment when Dead Can Dance are totally grooving out. Just listen to the 10 minutes long epic track Song of the Stars and how it beautifully builds up. Or the dramatic Indus. Now, obviously, you need to be partial for particularly Middle Eastern and North African music to fully enjoy this album. And I can understand that many people that appreciate Dead Can Dance would not rank it over into the Labyrinth or the debut album. But I just love the mood of this record. The last track, Devorzum, is interesting because it somehow seems to announce what only three years later Lisa's contribution to the Gladiator soundtrack is going to be. Number six, Spleen and Ideal from 1985. A somewhat transitional album, still the last one with conventional drums and bass, but already foreboding the band's new sound. 
it is the very first time that Kandans present a style that would become something of their trademark and a corner of the musical world solely associated with them and them only. And for so many years people would refer to certain sounds and vocals as that can dance type of music. It is this highly ethereal, often drony sound creating these slow vocal cathedrals. Time seems to entirely stop in these recordings as beautifully shown in the opening track De Profundis and the almost ambient-like second track Ascension. But this album marks also the arrival of the majestic, larger-than-life composition like Enigma of the Absolute, The Cardinal Sin and the energetic, homological mesmerism. Music reflecting enlightenment and the state of the human condition in the passing of time. The last three tracks of the album are somewhat overlooked gems, but they also strongly represent the old style of Dead Can Dance for a very last time here, before the band entirely moves to their more cinematic, large canvas sound. The melody of the song Advent seems to have been slightly repurposed by Brandon many years later in his solo track Voyage of Brown. Avatar is another dark gothic meditation by Lisa Gerard with this brooding, almost sinister bass guitar. The album closes with a real deep cut track, the poignant indoctrination, a design for living, brimming over with Brandon's melancholy. The album's title is taken from the famous Les Fleurs du Mal by Charles Baudelaire. And also this is one of my favorite album covers of all times. Back in the day I had a really difficult time to find out where this imagery comes from. Just from looking at it I always thought this must be some, some picture taken, I don't know, maybe in Armenia after a horrible earthquake or something like that. But as it turned out it is a photo made by an English photographer somewhere in the north of England uh, in an industrial part of a kind of ghost city being completely demolished. Number five. Dionysus from 2018. So this is probably a rather controversial album to some, although it was my impression that Dionysus, when it appeared in 2018, received very good reviews and was critically rather acclaimed. But this had probably to do with the fact that those that wrote about it were not die-hard Dead Can Dance fans with their high expectations. It is a strong concept album dealing with the Jungian and Nietzschean ideas of the Greek god Dionysus or Dionysus, particularly in the context of the Friedrich Nietzsche book The Birth of Tragedy from the Spirit of Music, which Nietzsche wrote in 1872. At the same time, the music is an attempt to recreate a dramatic and emotional environment that allows the listener to encounter the atmosphere of the early Hellenistic period, the birth of the European culture out in Greece thousands of years ago. So there is a very archaic vibe to the music, while at the same time the compositions certainly borrow a lot from Middle Eastern and Arabic music. Yes, the critique has been uttered that there is suspiciously few of Lisa Gerard on this record and that it even smacks of a Brendan Perry solo album, thinly veiled as a Dead Can Dance record. I guess that is all true and if this had been released as a Brandon Perry album I would like it the same nonetheless. Lisa is not absent here but it is true that her role seems somewhat diminished in favor of all kind of almost sample-like vocal snippets so this album was certainly created in a more computerized environment than most of the previous Dead Can Dance albums. That's all true. But then again, Dead Can Dance have never made an album that was predictable. So if another Dead Can Dance record would be released, and this time it would rely heavily on Lisa and less on Brandon, I would find it not surprising, just another interesting effort to do things differently. I have no problems with it. I guess of all the Dead Can Dance album, this one is the one which is mostly trance-like. So you need to be a bit in the mood for it, because this is a record that constantly drifts into one direction and you can't expect too many melodies or hook lines. There is an aggressive rawness to most of the tracks. It indeed feels like you are being transported 8000 years into the past 
on some island in the Aegean Sea, witnessing the moment when the dark, archaic rituals turn into the pantheon of Greek gods. And while you could make the argument that the album lacks versatility, I'm always surprised how quick it is over. So it certainly doesn't feel long-winded. Once it's over you feel like, oh really, that was 35 minutes? So that's why I really like this album and I like it probably more than some dumbfounded fans because the musical atmosphere is so unique and intense. That's some time travel right here, directly into your own historical movie. Number four, Anastasis from 2012. So when a band makes their comeback album, I'm always interested, but usually I do not hold my breath because oftentimes it is not a very convincing attempt. In case of Dead Can Dance, I am never worried. I always know that it's gonna be great. So when after 16 years there was, there was the talk of a new album, I knew it's gonna be wonderful, but I had no idea how it's going to sound. Anastasis was a wonderful musical statement. I don't think I have ever seen anybody slagging this album off. In a strange way, this record is an amalgamation of all the previous phases of the band into a new, yet very cohesive sound. A lot of the music certainly echoes Brendan Perry's solo albums, but you get a lot of connection to into the labyrinth here, and Spirit Chaser as well, and even a touch of those dark early years. But at the same time, Lisa Gerard's incredible soundtrack experience shows as well. The band has obviously evolved into this new, quite serious beast, mixing cinematic ideas with a lot of socio-economical and political anger, and it works beautifully. And the whole album is very neatly organized. Eight tracks, all of similar length. The track Anabasis incorporates the infamous hang or hung steel drum long before it became this rather awful fad for YouTubers. There are some amazing Middle Eastern vibes here, somewhere between Um Kultum and Transglobal Underground. It's just great fun to listen to this album. This is just one big musical drama unfolding between your ears, with a lot of mysticism and ritualistic spirituality. There is the underlying darkness to the tracks, but at the same time it is all very adventurous. Number three. The Serpent's Egg from 1988. As a follow-up album to the incredible Within the Realm of a Dying Sun, this LP has a difficult task. At the same time, Death Can Dance is a band that actually never repeats itself. That's why all the ten albums here are inherently different from each other, with a different focus. The droney opener, The Host of Seraphim, has become this signature type of track for Dead Can Dance. It certainly is one of the finest examples of Lisa Gerard singing. Now today, after all these ambient type of tracks and all these atmospheric music has conquered the Hollywood soundtracks by the hundreds, it may not appear as unique anymore, but in 1988 this was music that raised people's eyebrows. There was this notion of, oh, so music can do this as well. It is like frozen emotion, almost like glaciers slowly moving forward. This album has some incredible moments. The heartbreaking Severance as one of Brendan Perry's finest performances, probably a secret message about a relationship running its course after almost 10 years, but who am I to say? The B-side of this album is very playful and adventurous, for the first time digging into some serious ethnographic percussions, something that would become much more important on future albums. And the album closes with the majestic Ulysses, a typical Brandon Perry track filled with yearning for freedom and for setting sails to travel into the open sea, what the Germans call Fernweh, the aching for the distance. Number two, Aeon. Aeon arrived in 1990 and bookends a trilogy of amazing albums that deal with darkness and loneliness, but also with the symbolism of the 19th century and the influences of the Renaissance and the medieval times, which is most apparent on this album here. Dead Can Dance is at their most melancholic in this album, particularly because it is not as dark and forlorn and solitarily as the previous two records, but creates a wonderful 
ambiguity between pathos and solemnity. This is the one album where the elements of Renaissance and West European medieval music is actually quite strong, which is something that Dead Can Dance is being constantly associated with, but only here it actually applies. This record beautifully flows from one wonderful track to the next without missing a beat. After this wonderful, majestic, the arrival and the reunion which opens the album, you have the stomping Saltarello, which is an original Renaissance tune put through the Detkin Dance grinder. You have deeply touching compositions like Fortune Presents Gifts Not According to the Book, based on the verses of Luis de Gongora, a Spanish poet of the early Baroque era. This song tells you basically everything you need to know about the world we all live in. Just to quote, Because in a village a poor lad has stolen one egg, he swings in the sun and another gets away with a thousand crimes. And then there is Black Sun, a song that reminds me that I should probably make a video about my top 10 Dead Can Dance tracks and this song would be up there. A dark Darwinian meditation about the deepest principle of the life on this planet between evolutionary mechanics and the human psyche. It's quite incredible to put something like that into song, these dark notions that you would expect from Arthur Schopenhauer, Ezra Pound, Charles Baudelaire or Friedrich Nietzsche to name drop just a little. Give me 69 years, another season in this hell. It's all sex and death as far as eyes can tell. Like Prometheus we are bound, chained to this rock of a brave new world, our god-forsaken lot. And I feel that's all we've ever needed to know, till worlds end and the seas run cold. Give me 69 years, another season, in this hell, there is sex and death in Mother Nature's plans. And the album finishes with Radhark, a song foreboding the future, like the band is saying, get ready, because from now on we are changing focus and we will explore the world of the Middle East. This album is all over the place, but at the same time it is very coherent and has a wonderful flow to it that keeps you interested until the very last moment. Despite the fact that a lot of these themes feel like sketches and fragments and moods, but beautifully woven together. And number one, Within the Realm of a Dying Sun from 1987. This album is a dark metaphor for nature, I've always felt that the entire production is a meditation over Sandro Botticelli's painting Primavera from 1482. But words can hardly describe the depth of beauty, sadness and ecstasy woven together in this album. The band was at this point more like a trio, together with Peter Ulrich playing mostly percussive instruments. There is an interesting structure here where side one contains music sung by Brandon while the second side has Lisa in the foreground, which also creates this fascinating juxtaposition of their individual styles and preferences. Brendan's lyrics reflect a dark poetic look at our existence, musing over thoughts of despair, isolation and detachment, but not in a depressed way, but rather as a philosophical endeavor, while Lisa's non-lyrical style evokes ideas of nature and inspiration, her unique way of singing is sometimes being called glossolalia or singing in tongues and is certainly something known for centuries, particularly in a religious, sometimes even occult context. I will not even analyze every single track here, but I do believe that this is an example of a perfect album without a second wasted. Every track here is an incredible statement and an expression of unmatched beauty. My only grief with this album is that it is only 39 minutes long. Certainly the album sound is not as refined as the following records would be. There is a touch of living room, home studio type of feel to this music, but one could make the argument that this actually adds to the endearing qualities of the record. Because while this record works with a lot of violins and cellos, it never sounds like some overly polished and therefore boring rock meets classic album. It's more like escaping a snowstorm into a deep, dark forest. So, this was my ranking of all the studio albums by Dead Can Dance. 
And if you are not familiar with Dead Can Dance, then you have an assignment waiting, because this had been 40 years of incredible, mind-blowing music. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed the video, and uh, let's see what I come up next. Goodbye.